Hello again and welcome to World War II TV and this is the middle of Tank Week and I hope you joined us on Monday for Gareth's talk about the formation of British armoured units in the 1920s and 30s and then Richard yesterday to talk about machine guns but today I think this is going to be one of the popular shows of the week. We're going to talk about the German armoured units in Normandy prior to D-Day. Lots of confusion around this issue because there's the German units that were there already and then there are of course the German units that arrive later on when the Germans realize that's the big invasion. So um, two separate subjects. We're just tackling what the Germans have at their disposal in Normandy, both within striking distance of the beaches and a little bit further afield. And to join me, he's a bit of a World War II TV regular when he's not appearing actually on the shows. He's joining in on the comments from the Netherlands. It's it's Niels. Um, you've, you've seen him before. Hi, Niels. How are you doing? I'm fine. Thank you for having me. And for those who don't know, you are in the middle. I've just spoken to you. Your 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 book, forthcoming book, three volumes now about the German army um, in the Cotentin, which is part of Normandy. So you are the person yes. to ask about this. So um, uh, the German army in Normandy, it's the, this myth that there isn't much information out there. We, we talked about this on our historiography show. There is information out there. You just have to know where to look and how to assimilate from it. So... This is the result of, I guess, uh, over a, over a decade's work on your on your case now. Yeah, the book is pretty much the result of, I think, the, the first things that will be in the book started about in 2006 when I did a La Fiera article. It was basically the first time I really started looking into uh, a subject that hadn't been investigated uh, properly. Uh, when I, I want, At that time, I wanted to build uh, some nice models of, of what, what happened there, the French tanks. And that meant I had to do more research. And that's basically the first topic I, I addressed that was not yet uh, studied in any significant detail and were a lot of myths going around and things that were just plain wrong. And I decided to to go from there. Uh, and basically that grew into my understanding of what's hap what happened on the Cotentin. But in the years before that, I had also been looking at the German units, uh, the, the tank units, which fought in the Khan sector. So in that regard, it's nice to talk about those units, uh, which I haven't looked at in uh, quite some time. But it's fun to to readdress those because they're also very significant and also still quite poorly understood. Yeah, well, that's the thing. We will address some of these myths later on as we go through. It's just, um, you know, as I said in my tweet earlier today, you can pick up, pick up any book on Deed and it'll break down all unit by unit what makes up the American, British and Canadian armies. But the German army, there's still so, still so much um, um, myth perpetuation and frankly rubbish written. But, you know, you've, we've got to the point now, thanks to your work, that we have a much clearer picture of what the Germans had. So um, let's start at the beginning. Um, the German armies begin moving units into into Normandy as early as 19, you know, well, apart from the, the attack in 1940. In 1942, the Atlantic War begins construction. But there's a real evolution of units. They get rotated round and about. And so where, I don't know where you're going to start today, but 1943 is where things start sort of shaping up a little bit for the Germans. Yeah. So let, let's, there, let's start with that. Yeah, there's basically a watershed. It's, it's late 1943. Uh, in up to that point, uh, they were the Germans were starting to put in a uh, permanent coastal division, so that was one uh, thing they were already doing. But in uh, oc late October 1943, uh, von Hunstedt, as his commander in chief in the west, uh, wrote uh, uh, basically a situation report, uh, which is very important. And what he says in it, he, he looks very closely at the situation in Normandy, and his conclusion is well, even if we do. If the Atlantic Wall does everything we can realistically expect from it, and our troops do everything we can realistically expect from it, uh, the Allies are still going to get a foothold. So, as it stands, we're not going to be able to to decisively defeat them. Uh, well, there's a, this is a part of uh, the translation of that report. Uh, you can see he sort of places it uh, in the hands of uh, of Berlin, but he basically says we need to do something. And the second part is the most important one. The essential point of the coast defense behind the front lies in the assembly of sufficient, completely mobile, large-sized motorized reserves capable of striking a blow. This is the armor counterattack uh, they're talking about. And then there's the, the, the last bit in uh, of this page in this where, where its assessment is we are to be able to defeat an allied landing, we're going to need 
nine uh, Panzer divisions, Panzer Grenadier divisions that are fully operational and fully mobile. And that's something to keep in mind if we take a closer look at what was actually the situation on D-Day. Yeah, exactly. That that was a a, a, a hoped for scenario, not necessarily yeah. uh, what they achieved now. Yeah. And I think worth starting with just an ex a reminder of how big France is, how many but that cut much of a coastline there is and how by 1943, 1944, the, the Germans are stretched very, very thinly. They're still fighting in Italy. They're still fighting in the Balkans. They're still, you know, good defending the coasts of, um, of Belgium and the Netherlands. And, and uh, you know, so there's, a, there's a, only so many troops and units they have to cover the coast. So um, we're going to look at obviously focusing on Normandy today. So I'm going to move to the next image, which show, well, uh, do, is there anything you want to explain about that map? Uh... Uh, well, first of all, uh, to, to come back to Verhoenstedt, uh, in a few days later, after his report, uh, which had which had gone all the way to Berlin, uh, Hitler issued his uh, Directive Number Fifty One, which is the moment things start to change in the West. Uh, what Hitler says: uh, We have neglected the West uh, uh, for several years. Uh, that that was okay, considering basically what was happening in the East. Right now, we know uh, there is an invasion going to come. Uh, we need to be ready because we cannot afford to lose ground in the West. In the, on the Eastern Front, not so much a problem. In the West, it's a problem. So he says we need to prepare for, as von Rundstedt had suggested, a counterattack. He says our reserves need to be mobile. Our infantry needs to become more mobile. We need heavy anti-tank weapons. We need to improve our, our troops behind the front and as well as uh, his attempts to reinforce the coast itself. But it's also they're starting to focus on getting troops into Western Europe, not allowing them officially to be extracted unless there is permission from Berlin. Uh, so the Germans are starting, really starting their troop buildup. He says we would need to accelerate the the, the the pace in which the 21st Panzer Division is being armed, the 12th SS Panzer Division is being armed. Uh, so the all sort of thing starts to move after uh, after of early uh, November with uh, Directive 51. Uh, what we're seeing here on the map is the actual situation just before D-Day. This is this is June 3rd, 1944. Um, what's sort of interesting here is, uh, as von Hunstadt had said, I want nine fully operational armored divisions or uh, Armored infantry and so grenadier divisions. Now, if you start to look at what's going on, if we, maybe we can go to the south first. Yeah, we can see here on the on the right part uh, at the coast there is a circle. Yeah, that one. Uh, that's where the Ninth Panzer Division is being rebuilt. It's it's using a, a re, re, uh, reserve division which had already been stationed in Normandy, but this is where the uh, the Ninth Panzer Division is being rebuilt. It's not operational at the time of D Day. Uh, there's a lot, lots of going on, but it's not ready. And of course, the Germans are realizing the southern coast of France is under threat as well, so it needs to be protected. So, which is why they're starting to uh, move units there as well. And if you move a bit to the left, you can see another circle. Yeah, and that's where the second SS Panzer Division, Das Reich, is stationed. Uh, it's likewise being rebuilt, uh, not in a great condition. Uh, they're work, they're working on it, but it's not as Rundstedt had wanted, fully operational and fully mobile at, at the time of the invasion. Now, then we can go to the top left a bit. There's another circle near the coast. Yes, that's the 11th Panzer Division, which uh, would not play a part in, uh, in Normandy itself, but it later faced, uh, particularly uh, confronted the, the landings in the south and the approach of the uh, of Operation Dragoon towards the north. Uh, so that's the, that's the third Panzer Division. Uh, which is also basically still forming. Uh, then here in the center of the image, there's another circle. No, not uh, on the left. To the to the left. Yeah, that one. That's the that's a 17th SS Panzergrenadier Division, which is also not not fully ready. It's 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 improving, but it's uh, likewise. Uh, and as you can see, these these four divisions are sort of covering the west southwest coast and the southern coast. So. These are stationed in, in the sector of Army Group G, uh, which is important at a, as we can, I'll, we'll explain later. Yep. Uh, then we can uh, move, uh, move on further. Uh, yeah, that, if we, now we can go to, to Normandy. I'll do the, I'll do the, is that yeah. one okay? Yeah. I'll go back, that one. Yeah, that, this, this one's okay. Um, 
So uh, if w if we first go to Padakale a little bit, uh, there's a there's a circle with a red arrow, and uh, not the other one, the other one to the left, uh, no, yeah, below. That's right. Yeah, that yeah. one. Yeah, that one. Uh, that's the second uh, Panzer division. That division is uh, pretty close to being fully operational. Uh, it's a good division, uh, and it's protecting basically the 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 area south of the Padakale, and, uh, and being able to to strike in several uh, directions. Now, if we move a bit uh, to the south, uh, to the southwest from there, there's just uh, oops, sorry, no, the, the same, yeah. Uh, there's a circle just northwest of Paris. Yeah. On the north side, on the north side of the Seine, to the left. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that one, uh, that one uh, above the smaller circle. Yeah. Yeah, that one. That's the 116th Panzer Division. Uh, also, uh, still uh, being organized from the 16th uh, Panzer Grenadier Division. Um, it's close to the coast. Uh, but it's also not yet fully operational at all. Now, to the to the to the so uh, southwest of that division, there's the 12th SS Panzer Division, which is, yeah. as you can see, uh, quite close to Normandy. Uh, it's also uh, it's not fully uh, equipped yet, but it's as close as it's re it's it's close to being uh, fully operational at the, at that stage. And to the south of that division, uh, we have the Panzerleer Division. Right. Yeah, yeah, that area. That's the Panzer Division, which is likewise in in good condition, uh, overstrength in some part uh, elements even. So th that's the divisions that are not in, yeah, on the border of of the invasion area. And then we have at the division area itself, we have the 21st Panzer Division in the area, more or less uh, around Caen. Uh, and that's also a division not fully equipped, but on other uh, of other respects, it's it's pretty much operational. Um, this is also a good moment to take a brief look at, at the organization uh, they, they had in the West. To coordinate this counterattack, uh, the first thing that Hitler did was basically uh, assign Rommel. He was in charge of improving the, the Atlantic Wall and prepare for the, for the counterattack uh, against this invasion. Uh, at some point, uh, they also formed the, the so-called Panzergruppe West, the, the, the armored reserve in the West. And that's also where things become uh, a little tricky because who is in charge of the Panzergruppe? Uh, wants, to, wants to say in it, Berlin wants to say in it, uh, Rommel says, well, well, wait a minute, I'm responsible for the defenses and the counterattack. I want and I have a say in this. And you get a uh, going back and forth who's responsible for what, who is authority over what. And the problem, of, uh, one of the problems for, of uh, Rommel is. He wants control, but he's only in charge at this stage. He's been given command of Army Group B. And and that means uh, he's in charge for basically uh, the area you see right here on the on the map, uh, from the south to the north here. So 7th Army uh, defending Brittany and Normandy, 15th Army defending basically northern France and Belgium, and then uh, the troops in the Netherlands. But Technically, the entire armored reserve is for the entire sector, so also for Army Group G in the south. In the end, in uh, by May, there is an official decision. They, they, they look at who's responsible for what, who, and Rommel gets control over three Panzer divisions. He gets the 21st Panzer Division, which, as we have seen, is close to Caen. He gets control of the 116th Panzer Division, which is uh, northwest of Paris, and he gets control over the 2nd Panzer Division. So he has three divisions, and he divides them over the most threatened areas, basically. He also wanted control over the 12th SS Panzer Division, and was also talking about putting it into Normandy uh, west of... And he wanted his troops to the close to the coast, because he said, well, we're going to be too late if, we, if, if they're not there. And mm -hmm. that's also where the others said, well, you can try it, but we need to mass our armor, because otherwise it's pointless. Uh, both arguments, point of view, have merit, and both of them are extremely uh, influenced by what they can do by the by what the allies can do and that's also uh, very important to realize at this stage the allies are in control at, at the, they the, the germans know it we don't know where they're going to attack we don't know exactly when they're going to attack uh, we're not the germans expected uh, multiple attacks one of which would only be the real invasion so the Germans are very careful in what are we go, what can we do? But also they're limited because, as we have seen, most of their armored units are not fully operational. So you can say there are three uh, in the in this particular area on this map there are three divisions 
that are fully operational, uh, sorry, uh, four oper divisions that are fully operational, basically 21st Panzer Division, 12th SS Panzer Division, Panzerleer Division, and the 2nd Panzer Division. And if you look at this, actually, three out of four are on the right side of the Seine River already. Yeah. So people were saying, well, the, the Germans were very late in sending their troops to the front. Uh, well, they were on the right side. It's far worse if they had been uh, farther away. It would be nice to have another division, of course, closer to the beach. But the Germans are have they're not in control of the situation. They have to respond. So that this so they did come up with this decision, which has been very heavily criticized. But on the other hand, you can really uh, you really need to assess the situation to determine was there much else they could have done. And I think it's a reasonable uh, decision based on the circumstances. Was it ideal? No. Uh, neither was the solution Rommel had. Uh, Berlin, the army group of uh, the Panzer Group itself, wanted to say in things because, well, they're the, we're the Panzer boys. We want control of our own troops. We know how we're going to use them. So there's this going on. Uh, it's not a all... point just to mention, Neil, that this it's this delegation problem that, that is running rife through German command right now, isn't it? If yes. you compare it to the Allies, and we've said this on other shows. Everybody knows exactly where their responsibility begins and where it ends. There's this clear hierarchy, and I'm in charge of this bit, the Germans. And that's why we get these articles you see all the time saying Hitler's tank reserves, Rommel's tank reserves, von Rundstedt's tank reserves. They're, they're, talk, they're talking about all this, and they're giving it a different chief. But in fact, even at the time, the three chiefs, if you if you count Hitler and the, and the, the commander as one of the chiefs, there, there's this this difficulty of knowing exactly who's in charge of doing this and it's not the units they have it's who's in command of them and who actually has complete jurisdiction to just um take a plan and do it in their way yeah yeah it, it, it it's 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 chaotic and you also have egos uh in the matter people want control people want, want power uh it it's it's a very dysfunctional system at, at the time in, 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 in the German military, but it's also only able to exist in this way because they are they are short stretched. Yeah. They are they are in trouble. If they had plenty of troops, it wouldn't have it wouldn't really have be, be, been an issue. You can you can do several things, but in this case, uh, you you can't do one thing because if you do that, you're you're getting your your ass kicked uh, somewhere else. So yeah. they're trying yeah. to to find a middle ground. And there's also some things that, uh, if you look at some of conversations and contacts, Rommel and and Lundstedt are not uh, as opposed to each other's point of view as as is sometimes suggested. But Rommel uh, Lundstedt sometimes also says, "Well, we can do this," and he he tells Berlin, but that that's that's the following consequences. And he and von Lundtjes is still responsible for the entire Western Front, which is different from Rommel, who at that time is responsible basically for the area we see here, which is of course the area most under threat. Yeah. But just to get just to give an idea of how the German thinking was in late 1943 when von Lundtjes wrote his report, he's actually talking about protecting the, the the Spanish border. So that's sort of just to to get to to get a glimpse and an idea of. of of, of what kind of things they're, they're considering. And an attack in southern France is also something they're taking extremely serious and increasingly so. So there, there's different responsibilities, there's different circumstances, and they're trying to find a way which there is no ideal solution. No. I mean, they're, they're, whatever decision they make, they're going to leave a gap somewhere and they're going to have some units in the wrong place. They haven't got enough to put them everywhere, so it's always going to be a compromise to yep. just try and do the best they can, but you know they're they're up against it. They're up against numbers. They're up against the the the, the organization of the Allies, and they know that. But yep. so tank division. But they, what gets very complicated? I'll let you go into it in your own yep. pace, your own speed. You have the, the 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 infantry units and the independent units in Normandy that also have an armored element, and this is where it gets much more complicated, and and where we're going to rely on your your supreme research into this. Yeah. Uh... I think you can move a slide. Right. Yeah, this is this one's interesting. Uh, this is also from uh, von Rundstedt's report. Uh, on the upper left here, uh, there's no title here, but that's the one, uh, the 716th Pencil Divi of uh, uh, Infantry Division, which was responsible uh, at this stage for the entire Calvados. Uh, so the, not not the Cotentin Peninsula, but the area 
uh, to the east, uh, which has Bayeux and Ka and, and ultimately uh, four of the five invasion beaches. Yeah. So that's what we're seeing here. And what is, what's important here is, uh, well, it's all important what you see, but the anti-tank defenses is worth picking out. There's no anti-tank battalion. There's only one uh, anti-tank company with heavy anti-tank guns. Uh, the infantry doesn't have mobile anti-tank guns. So this is terrible if you're trying to, to defend uh, an allied attack. And the situation for the other divisions in the air is not, uh, not a whole lot better. Uh, what we have here is the, the 709th Infantry Division. And basically, the situation is pretty much the same. Uh, no, in this case, they, yeah. But they, they have only, uh, at this stage, they also have some uh, anti-tank guns in their infantry regiments. Uh, but are, they only have an anti-tank company, uh, which at this stage has nine in, uh, heavy anti-tank guns. What's also important to realize is that they had wanted to improve things uh, a long time before. In late 1942, they were already uh, talk and they were actually had decided to give uh, both the 716 and the 709 division uh, a company of self-propelled anti-tank guns, which didn't arrive until, well, this is October 1943, and they still haven't arrived. They ultimately arrived uh, uh, in, de in December. So I about a year later than they had intended. And in the meantime, they had been uh, trying to find solutions uh, to beef things up. They were using outdated anti-tank guns. Uh, they were using uh, what were basically static guns intended for the coastal defenses uh, in a mobile role. So just to have an anti-tank uh, element that they could use as a division. Uh, but they were also using uh, the, the, the rather old uh, R35 uh, French Renault tanks armed with a Czech uh, 47 uh, millimeter uh, anti-tank gun. So they were trying, they, they were already th wanting to, to improve uh, uh, anti-tank defense as early as uh, 1944 or 1942, but it took a year before these vehicles actually arrived, which is also illustrative for the, the, the problems and lack of priority given to, to France and the West uh, in 1942, 1943. Um, we're gonna skip over the 319th because it was on the, on the, uh, on the, on the Channel Islands, which yep. is it's yep. it's it's still interesting because it was uh, very strong and ultimately did absolutely nothing there. <laughs> um, and then in this case, it's also worthwhile to look at the 346th Infantry Division, which at this uh, time was part of uh, of Seventh Army, but at, on D-Day it was uh, part of Fifteenth Army, and it was just to the uh, the east of the invasion area, basically. Uh, and the situation uh, is somewhat different. Uh, this this particular division uh, had received a company of uh, self-propelled anti-tank guns. Uh, so this this one uh, had already some of those vehicles that had, the other two divisions were also supposed to have already, but they had been given to this particular division at that time. Yeah. So we can. Yes. Uh, this is this is a a good illustration of that. Uh, this shows what's going on in the West in, I think this is November uh, uh, 1943. So you can see the anti-tank guns that are available to the different uh, units. Uh, in, the, in the top uh, row, you can see the categories, uh, French, uh, French guns, uh, uh, in this case on uh, the big uh, B1B uh, B, uh, tanks. Uh, only re uh, relevant in this case for the Channel Islands, where there was a battalion with those tanks. Uh, then you have the converted, basically, French uh, 75 millimeter guns, uh, which had been put on a, a German uh, uh, carriage, uh, which were decent uh, anti-tank guns, which were considered, despite being 75 millimeter, as medium anti-tank guns. And you can see uh, Eigenes and uh, Bodenständig, and the first one is or uh, organic, uh, anti-tank guns and the other bonus standing is basically uh, static and static doesn't mean immobile in this case but belonging to a specific sector rather than to a unit so um, and when you move further to the right you can see the really powerful anti-tank guns the the, the pack 40 uh the pack 40 mounted on uh on lorraine uh chassis the self-propelled guns and as you can see in this particular case you have the 346 which which then with which has 10 of those and the uh, Further in Brittany, you have also the 343rd, which has these. And in both cases, you can see these are static. So these do not belong to these units. They have been given access to these. They can operate them, but they do not belong to, to these particular units. So that's also uh, 
something you see quite quite a lot if you start to look into other infantry units in the west as well there is there is some armor it's being moved around between sectors where there's priority uh, if a division leaves the vehicles remain behind they get transferred to the, the replacement division so that's one of the things you see uh, which is why you have static uh, mo you have self-propelled guns which are static so that's uh it's a bit <laughs> a confusing, but there, yeah yeah, yeah. But it's, that's why you shouldn't really use the word static, but basically the, you should realize bonus advantage means belonging to a sector. And then you have the, the, the column on the right, which are the, is basically the most powerful anti-tank gun at the time, the, the 88 uh, millimeter, not, not flak, but real uh, anti-tank guns. Uh, although this is the, the, the more cumbersome early version with the, with the, with the less uh, uh, easy to, to move uh, carriage. And you can see how these are all of these are st are static guns uh, belonging to the sector but uh there at least the 716th division has eight of them uh at their disposal and so is the 709th and these changes do uh these numbers change and improve a bit over time but this that's basically the situation in late 1943 which is which is just not very many is it i mean every, no. all of those columns bar two are single digit that's uh, yeah this is this is it's not good <laughs> no um yeah, and this is also one of the things that Hitler wants to improve with this his directive. He says we need to put more anti-tank guns, and he, he aims a number so many anti-tank guns, a few dozen each month are going to go to the West. He realizes it's a mess. Uh, at some point, they create uh, a special staff, uh, uh, Omigen, uh, named after uh, commanding officer, and he's going to inspect the situation. He's going to do recommendations, and he's going to check. And his numbers on the number of anti-tank guns per kilometer are just staggering. If you look at it, it's very, very limited. And it does really improve. It does on the coast. It does improve towards the uh, towards the invasion. But this is the situation in 1943, late 1943, when you can see they're in trouble if the, if anything's happening at yeah. this particular time. Uh, yeah, this is this is uh, this is earlier, but this is in, in interesting for this 1942. But what this also shows is you can see the uh, the numbers of, of the uh, Renault 35 uh, tank destro uh, tank destroyers. So that's the, the the first column with the numbers, and you can see there is, there are five of of these uh, available to the 709th Infantry Division. Uh, the, there are 24 on the Channel Lines, which were still there on D-Day. Um, and then there's two in the sector of the of the of the 716 division, and there's two more in in Brittany with the 346. Uh, so this must be 1942, by the uh, 43. Um, so this is basically at this stage, uh, and most of these units are also static. They are moved around. They can use them uh, as long as they're there, as they need them, but it's not an ideal solution. At this time in 1943, uh, you have the, the an the anti-tank company basically of the the 709th infantry division which has three different kinds of anti-tank guns in its in it in its ranks it has the the check guns it has uh, uh five centimeter anti-tank guns uh it has 88s uh and it so and there's, there's another type of I, I i'm overlooking right now uh so uh that's a single company so it's it's not ideal and that they also realize we're going to need to, to make changes but this is just all to illustrate how problematic the situation was for the Germans it, yeah. already in 1943, and it's and that and this is why uh, it's interesting if we move on to these units, these divisions, to see how they develop. Yeah, we're going coming back to this one later. Yeah, sure. Just, just go to the infantry units. Yeah, yeah. And and just to say, folks, by the way, when people talk generally about there being no information about what the German units had in Normandy, the proof here. Niels has got the information. Here is the documentation that says how many this sector has, how many this division has. You know, this is, this is, this is kind of revolutionary stuff that we're doing here. It may look at first glance just like some tables, but for those who want to study the Battle of Normandy, this is really pertinent, important information we're conveying. And we are going to show you some photos of tanks later on, folks. Just we're going Plenty. through the organization bit first. Yeah. Uh, so. We have had uh, Hitler's orders, his, his directive 51, we're going to need to improve our defenses. Uh, this is also true for the infantry divisions. Uh, we're the, so this is three of them, the 243rd Infantry Division, uh, which moved to Normandy in June uh, of uh, January 1944. Uh, the 352 is famous for being at Omaha, of course, yeah. which was being uh, raised in, this, uh, in late 
late last few months, uh, basically of 1943 uh, in Normandy already. So it, it was already there. Uh, and then we have the 346, which had started out as the 243rd Infantry Division, also had started out as an uh, as a static division. And both of these had been selected to uh, get increased mobility, uh, which ultimately put the 243rd Infantry Division even beyond that of a regular infantry division. Um, so these are divisions that are, and these have been selected to be mobile, to be able to be used as an as a counterattack force, as a mobile force, which was uh, absolutely clear that the Germans needed uh, needed such units. Um, what we are seeing here is an image from the theoretical organization of a standard German infantry uh, division, as it was uh, decided basically in late 1943. Uh, there's three of these four different options how they could organize a division's uh, anti-tank uh, elements. The first one, uh, this is one of the, the other ones, but the first one is just a company with uh, towed anti-tank guns, basically 12 uh, mo mo uh, motor tractors. Uh, that's the smallest amount of armor of uh, anti-tank capabilities a division can have. So there's, there's that bit. And after that, if you go beyond that and you start to improve and strengthen units, you form battalions. Uh, this is the battalion uh, that was chosen for several of these divisions uh, in Normandy uh, that would fight in Normandy. Uh, what we see here uh, is we, at the flag at the, at the top means battalion. Uh, the, the icon to the, to the right, this, the square bit uh, with the wheels on it is a, is a HQ company, Stops company. Uh, which the division of the, the in Normandy did not actually have, uh, but it, this was the theory uh, in 1943. Uh, the other elements you can see here they did have on the right, which is would be first company because German numbering in these tables or these graphic overviews are numbered right uh, to left because it's it basically it's as it as they would appear on a parade ground. So when someone's inspecting them, it's looking at them. It's still left to right, but for us looking at this, it's right to left. Right. So the first the first company uh, of these divisions would get self-propelled anti-tank guns. The this is S stands for Schwer Heavy, and they would get 14 of them. At this stage in the war, that means uh, Marder Three basically, uh, and th these were assigned to quite a lot of divisions, who, which later fought in Normandy. Not all of the infantry divisions, especially the ones that were formed later, but existing divisions and the division that was quite far our advanced in forming, like the 352, uh, they were given permission to form such units, and that's what, what that basically that's what happened. Uh, if you look at the the, the rhomboid figure, that's the second company. No, that's the yeah, that's that one uh, with with an arrow. This is a an assault gun company. Uh, not a battery because this is anti-tank units, which are not batteries. Batteries are artillery. This is a company, uh, and the Germans made it even more complicated because at in early 1944 they start decided we're not going to call these companies. We're going to call these but of Abteilung, uh, which basically means detachment, but it's also the same word for uh, used for anti-tank battalion. So it's a bit of a, a battalion having a battalion in a battalion, which is why I prefer to call these companies as well. Although Officially, they were named differently. Uh, so these are Stuk three in almost every infantry division. Uh, Ten pieces of them, uh, which is, were in most cases were delivered in in March and April to these divisions. And then we go all the way to the left. Uh, that's the third company with the symbol of, in this case, a self-propelled uh, anti-aircraft gun. Uh, there's several options for this. Uh, in this case, the two stands for two centimeters. Uh, but there's also the, the the possibility of 37 millimeter guns. Uh, either uh, some of these were uh, fully of were tracked. Uh, 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 sorry, based on uh, on half tracks, uh, but others were just towed. And it's a combination of what's going on. And even if you look at the three, uh, uh, sorry, the 709th Infantry Division, it's still not clear, even from eyewitnesses, how exactly. Uh, this, their anti-aircraft uh, anti company was equipped. So there's still things we do not know, but there is there are plenty of things we do know. Um, so what what do we get? Uh, here we have. Oh, this, it's okay to to, to move to the Sorry, other one. Yeah, I was. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So uh, to recap, uh, to to look at this, we have a division, the 243rd, which is defending the west coast of uh, of the Conan Peninsula, which has uh, 40 martyrs self-propelled uh, guns, and it has 10 Sturmgeschütze. And this is the same for the division uh, behind Omaha Beach. 
uh, where there were stationed more or less southeast of Isigny sur Mer. And then we have east of the invasion area, you have the 346th, uh, which had, had uh, their own ar armor uh, in their own anti tank battalion, uh, which later fought the British uh, and lost uh, two of its vehicles at quite well known photos at uh, Breville. Uh, so now we can go back to the, the static divisions. Uh, and what we see here is their organization, basically as it was reported in the last known report before D-Day. Uh, on the left, we have the 709th Infantry Division, which has a battalion staff that's indicated by the flag. And then we have a uh, self-propelled uh, anti-tank gun, which in this case were not Marder 3, but these were French-based uh, uh, 75 millimeter Pac-40, uh, better known as Marder 1s, based on the Lorenz uh, chassis. And then we can also see here the, 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 the second company. These are towed motorized anti-tank guns, 75 millimeter, 12 pieces of them. Um, and then to the left, we have an example of a division which had motorized uh, 37 millimeter uh, flat guns, basically. And that's what we are, are seeing here. And this is a fairly strong, uh, for static division, this is a fairly strong uh, anti anti-tank battalion, which a lot of divisions which fought in Normandy or, or, or sent battle groups normally didn't have. The units in, in Brittany, uh, basically none of them had anything like this. So you can see the Germans are given priority to the defense of Normandy, which is also something you can see if you look at other aspects, how they started sending uh, construction troops to the Atlantic Wall in 1943, 1942, because they realized this is this is where we really need to worry about, especially and as well as the, the rest of Northern France, but Brittany and other sectors are the same. Okay, we've done enough there. Let's focus completely on the most threatened area, which yeah. is also one of the reasons why they're starting to improve uh, anti-tank elements, basically in these sectors. Um, well, then to the right, we have an, another, uh, well, it, it's listed as a battalion, but as far as I know, they never formed a battalion staff. Uh, which is uh, interesting, but this might also be a good reason for that, because if you look at this image on the right, you have a the same kind of uh, self-propelled anti-tank guns. These are also Marder 1. And to the left, uh, we have a company with anti-tank guns, but there is no circle symbol uh, above it. So these are static, as they are right. reported on, on this. Uh, they're immobile. Uh, there's always a bit of a question, to what extent is this what's on paper, to what extent did they have vehicles, but are they not shown? And this is something you always need to keep in mind uh, when you look at German tables of uh, graphic representations. What are they showing? Uh, is, does this match what they're supposed to be, or is there something else going on? And that stuff you can only really get if you go really deep into the to personal accounts, uh, deeper into the archives, and then you might find an answer and maybe you, you won't. For instance, here on the left, what was supposed to be a self-propelled company of, uh, of, of two centimeter flag, this is how it shows. There's no number on it, which under it, which, may, which technically should mean they didn't have any, but there's plenty of evidence they did. So this is a bit of a case, uh, what, what's going on here. Uh, on another uh, uh, or previous uh, overview, they, they had listed 12, which is basically the number you would, you would, uh, you would expect. Mm -hmm. So this is a bit to illustrate, uh, you can see things on, on, a, on a German uh, organization, uh, but it's, always, it's often uh, that they're, they're strange things and you need to find out and try to figure out what's going on. And there's not always a clear cut answer. And that's that's the same uh, in this case, basically with the anti-aircraft anti uh, companies in both divisions, where we, we still don't know everything uh, enough about, the, about these. And how much of this is, is German commanders falsely reporting their strength because they don't want to admit they've got vehicles under repair, that they've got spare parts problems? Is, it, is there is an element of that involved? Uh, I think on the right here, that's that's if, if if there's either something going on or this is a mistake. Right. Uh, in other in other cases, when we look at the 21st Panzer Division, uh, there's uh, there's an at some one of the units basically has should have an have a fifth battery because we have photos of it, but it's not on the report. So there's always uh, things going on. There's also sometimes developments going on, reorganizations that are misrepresented. Uh, they're going to changes. They don't know uh, what's, 
what, what, what are we supposed to report at this particular stage? Uh, there's uh, vehicles coming up that are not yet reported. Uh, so it's always important to, to see what's going on. Uh, when do, do vehicles actually arrive? When do they get reported? And it's um, so there are sometimes uh, unit uh, vehicles being hidden. Sometimes vehicles are not being reported uh, because they're they're outdated and there's basically no reason for to report them. You keep them on hand if you have them. It's also the case in the 12th uh, SS Panzer Division, which has uh, a number of Panzer II's in its uh, in its ranks. Uh, but then only when you start to look deep, look deeper into them, you, you you find them. And sometimes it's just photos. There's a photo of one of those knocked out at uh, at Carpiquet. And if you don't know what's going on, you think, what's what's that thing going there? And if you look at the at the basic level of German reports, you won't find them. So there, so if you think German overviews and reports tell you everything, they don't because there's things moving, it's war. Uh, there's a reason not to report certain things, there's a reason to report other things, which is also why, for instance, in, in Normandy on the Cote and 10, there were old Renault uh, FT tanks available. They had been stat part of the static inventory and at some point they stopped reporting them, but there's but they again show up on photographs, so they were they were either still there or they came with another unit, which is a, a, a good moment to talk about the two uh, units we're seeing here and uh, yeah, yeah. and on the bottom row. Uh, well, let's start with the one on the right first. Um, this is Panzer Ersatz und Ausbildungsabteilung 100, basically tank training and replacement uh, replacement and training battalion 100. Uh, this is an interesting unit. It's, as the name says, it's a training unit. Uh, it's quite old, 1941 unit. Uh, it's been shifted to Normandy uh, uh, quite shortly before the invasion. And it is a fascinating collection of different types of, of vehicles. Uh, I've left out the entire types here, but um, first of all, what's interesting are the units, uh, the, the square units at, at the bottom. Just let, let's start with those two. Uh, these are infantry companies. These are training infantry companies, uh, basic infantry training uh, before moving on to serve, uh, serving on these on, on actual tanks. So they have two platoons of infantry and they have one platoon each of uh, R35, Renault R35 uh, light tanks. Um, and then we have the, the unit uh, to the right of the flag, which is a stops company, which also had uh, five, a five platoon with the five R35 tanks. Um, these are also the type of tanks you see. Uh, two of them were knocked out at, uh, at Lafayette. Uh, so they're quite famous for that. Uh, and then in the center, there is probably the most interesting company, the only actual tank company uh, at this report from which this one is, uh, this particular one is from April 44. Uh, this is a proper uh, company. Uh, it's led, unlike uh, most uh, books say, uh, by two Panzer trees, so old uh, German short barrel uh, tanks, uh, Panzer trees, and it has three uh, three companies, or uh, three platoons. Uh, two of these are armed, are equipped with uh, Hotchkiss tanks, one of which was also knocked out uh, in front of the of Lafia Bridge, another one at uh, Coquigny. Um, and the, the other company, uh, other platoon has four uh, R35 tanks as well. Uh, and these different platoons have a heavier tank to uh, as a command vehicle, basically. So one has a Panzer III, one has a heavy, big uh, Char B1Bs, and the other one has a Sumwa. Uh, so you have a very motley collection of armor in this particular unit. And if you look at photographs, uh, you can also see uh, uh, training vehicles, some running on uh, on wood gas. Uh, these are also not reported because what we're seeing on, on these kinds of overviews are upper, are combat vehicles. So there, you don't find uh, uh, trucks here. You don't find other sorts of vehicles. This is about uh, what's what's going to be able to to deliver a punch. So you have a very uh, strange collection of vehicles, and it gets even stranger when you look at, at photographs, because we're, uh, if you look at the Panzer trees. Uh, there's one knocked out at Lafayette. Uh, there's, there's footage of two uh, being captured at uh, Caranton. And there's photos of at least three more in this particular sector. So what's going on? Uh, and that's something uh, with a training unit, it's very delicate. And the problem is in this particular case is also that 
April 44 is the last report we have. So there's plenty of time for, for, uh, for additional vehicles to be moved around, uh, re, uh, being removed, being added. Uh, there was talk of replacing uh, uh, vehicles with uh, not this particular battalion, but with, with, for instance, the 21st Panzer Division. So there's a lot uh, of options of what's going on. And th that's only, I've been looking at these for, for about 15 years now, and I still don't have an answer on how exactly they were armed. But well, just, just to interrupt you again for a second, Neil, because yeah. you, you dropped in the line, there's a Panzer III at Lafayette. Well, it, you know, you're you're not doing your... You're not taking the credit for your being one of the main people who identified it was a Panther III because I was going to make the point at some point that so many of the books about the Battle of Normandy by English, American, Canadian authors, they've relied on the English, Canadian, American version of what armor they come up against. Rather yeah. than going to German archives, it's it's what do the British after action reports, modern reports say, and they've gone off what they have said. You've gone back the other way and you've started with what the Germans said they've had. And that's why, you know, for years, when I was first in Normandy, the first tank knocked out at Lafayette was well, it was always it, it, people just said Renault's. Then there was a truck being mentioned. You were you were the one who looked at the photos. You looked at the 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 the, the, the photos on the on the uh, the vehicle dumps after the war, what have you, and you identified that it was a Panzer three at Lafayette. So, folks, a lot of this work that we're doing, or the Neils is doing, is has been kind of groundbreaking stuff. And this this breaking down of these charts is really important because you'd be surprised how infrequently we said at the top of the show people get this information correct in their books and then and you know your your work to uh to learn how to dissect this this documentation and how to compare it to the photos and compare it to combat reports is is to your credit neil so um i hope people realize what a privilege it is to get this information because this this isn't out there folks this stuff uh until neil's books come out yeah, we'll have a lot of these uh, these overviews uh, with with, yeah, with more yeah. with uh, with more details. But it's just to give you an idea that there is quite a lot of that's really a lot of information out there. But you have to go look for it, and it's also uh, one of the things I found absolutely fascinating uh, when I looked at Lafayette is this this level of research was also would all, would also wouldn't have been possible if I hadn't looked at the at the Allied uh, side of the story, because it's it's American photographs who really tell what uh, help tell what happened. Uh, but one general rule is always do not trust identifications of knocked out enemy armor. Just as yeah, don't believe absolutely. if yeah. if if someone says uh, an 88 fired at me, well, they mean they probably mean artillery and the chances of that being an 88 is quite small, actually, although in the very sector I'm researching that chances is considerably bigger than in other sectors. But yeah, uh, 88 Tigers. Yeah, that we can take all that with a pinch of salt. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it, it's it's just very important when you read stuff like that, uh, realize uh, the source of the information and don't don't take it as gospel. Just if if they talk about 88, think uh, it's artillery or an anti-tank gun, which more likely is a 75. Uh, and if they're talking about tigers, it's some sort of armored vehicle. If they're in the British sector, they talk, they like to talk about elephants or Ferdinands or whatever, uh, which, which is a self-propelled gun, basically. So as long as you keep that in mind when you read stuff, it's 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 okay. Just don't make the mistake as a very, one very well-known author has done in his book about Normandy who messed up three different vehicles in one sentence, which is sort of impressive. Uh, uh, well, yeah. Um, and, and on the subject of vehicle, that's that's we, you you kindly sent sent some um, pictures of the just so we can run through what yeah. type of vehicles are here. So we've got yeah. the next five or six still slides are our vehicles. So just just explain what we have in these photos. Just give our people a visual idea of what type of weapon we were talking about. Yeah, uh, what we're seeing here is a Mardo one. This is uh, this is on the highway between. Uh, uh, Saint Mary Glees and Montebourg. So this is Cousin Ten uh, ter territory. This is one of the vehicles of uh, this, the 709th Infantry Division, their tank, uh, their anti-tank battalion. Uh, what we're seeing here is a uh, is a French uh, armored tractor, basically, uh, which has a German superstructure, and then they added a uh, a, a, a 75 uh, millimeter gun to it. Uh, and this and the word. This particular one, uh, we know this was knocked out uh, just uh, uh, at a place called uh, Le Roti, 
which is about uh, halfway between uh, neuville au plain and, uh, and Montebourg. And what we're seeing here is, is refugees returning of uh, escaping from the north towards the Maglis. And when, what exactly happened to this particular vehicle is, is, is not known, how it was knocked out. It wasn't, it's too far away from uh, several known battles uh, to link it to, to, a, uh, to a battle we have descriptions of. So it's, uh, it's a bit of a mystery what happened to this particular one, mm. but we know more or less where it was knocked out. And, and just to, to address questions as they're coming in, um, Craig is asking about generally the ammunition that would be available and i mean that's going to be very random because we've got all these different types of model ones model twos pack 40 75 millimeter guns i mean the amount of ammunition going to be available to different units is going to be very varied isn't it and is there anything about how much ammunition was held anywhere or is that kind of all guesswork uh there, there's some information about uh about uh, ammunition, uh, but it, it's very important to realize that these martyrs, uh, both types of martyrs, uh, the pack 40s they're firing, this, they're, they're having the same gun, basically. So that's not a problem. As long as it's modern and German, it's not a problem. And if you look at the, the French tanks, uh, they're very small caliber. So ammunition supplies in itself, you're not talking about massive shells, you're talking about rounds this yeah. big so it, it's a completely different ball game uh it's far easier to supply the uh the germans uh, captured vast stocks of these i've never come really come across uh shortages in uh reported shortages among these particular units and probably because of the uh one box can hold a lot of uh hold, mm. and hold a lot but of rounds maybe, maybe spares for tracks maybe spares for engine parts might be a bit yeah. more complicated yeah. but but the, in terms of ammunition it's not the main problem no it's it's not something you come you come across actually the in the end the the shortages are particularly uh, affecting the uh, the 20 millimeter guns the flag guns which fire at incredible rates uh, that's where you get it but you yeah, you do get it for for these heavier types of uh, uh, anti tank guns as well uh, yeah this is uh, this is another example of supposedly one hit by uh, by a naval round may have been just heavy artillery because it's very thin, very thin armor. Uh, this is a Martyr III. This is the type of vehicle. Uh, this one is typically uh, attributed to the uh, 352nd uh, Infantry Division, which defended Omaha, although this one is uh, in photographed in July, I believe. Uh, so this is a type uh, we, you can see in the three di uh, infantry divisions with the anti-tank battalion, which I mentioned, the 352, the 243rd, uh, and uh, the 346th. Uh, they had this type of vehicle, 14 of these, and these were again uh, basically a pack 40. Or in this case, on a on a modified Czech uh, chassis, a very good, reliable vehicle for what its uh, purpose was, but very thinly armored. Yeah. This is this is this is this is an this is basically an ambush vehicle. This is not though. This is not going to take on enemy vehicles but in this case in normandy uh, lightly armored as long as you can get off your first shot and get out but yes, that's get another the first shot off get the first shot off and then and then bugger off yeah yeah Be really because cool. yeah because uh the, the germans were, were were scared of allied artillery uh and they had and that's one of the main german shortages it, throughout normandy it's almost always it's artillery and the, the germans also start saying well when we have enough artillery we can hold a front so it's a bit of an exaggeration, but it's it gives an impression, mm. uh, and it's also a lot better if you're under artillery fire to know that the other side is under artillery fire as well. So it's yeah. also it's a, it's also it's also a morale thing. But the variety of art, of different artillery pieces is probably a far bigger problem to keep supplied with ammunition than than the anti tank uh, guns. Yeah, and that are, that could make a show in its own right. If we started talking about yeah. the artillery available on the coast, I mean that could be that could be two or three shows because I mean, you know, you even take a sector like Utah Beach, there's there's countless number of types of artillery piece in that area there. So that's a potential minefield, no pun intended, but we could do that in a future show if we wanted to, if this one's popular and it's it, lots of people watching it at the moment, so it's proving to be popular. So Oh, there's so um, many topics we can talk about. Yes, yeah. this is this. Yeah, uh, this is a really this is, good photo. This is this is this is this is a rare one. Yeah, this is a this is a nice one from the from the Bundesarchiv. Is this one? Uh, this is a Samoa. Uh, this is this is yeah, often uh, called the best uh, French tank of 1940. Uh, this particular uh, one is uh, belong to the sister unit of the 206th uh, tank battalion. 
which I think we 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 overlooked just at, uh, just then. Uh, but it's uh, it's okay. I can address uh, that that company uh, of that battalion uh, with this. Um, this particular battalion, uh, this is in this case sister unit. Uh, these were raised in late 1943. Uh, uh, these were compl completely equipped with captured French tanks, and basically they only had two types. They had this type, and they had the, the Hotchkiss, and uh, they had two com they had two companies. Uh, each company was e was uh, uh, was armed with uh, was led by by two of these, of one of these, and supported by two uh, Hotchkiss, and then three platoons with one of these and four Hotchkiss tanks. So you have uh, you have 15 tanks in a in a company, and yeah, there are two of those companies, and then they had the staff, uh, which had two more of these, and also uh, five uh, big uh, sharp B1Bs. And in the case of the 206, it's a bit more complicated because they may or may not have had uh, a flamethrowing uh, B1Bs, which is a rare, very rare beast in Normandy, as well as two more uh, R35s. And there's some theories on what's going on. Uh, I think it's quite possible that the R35s actually belong to to the Luftwaffe, or uh, or more likely uh, the Kriegsmarine, uh, because R35s were used uh, to tow uh, uh, to tow uh, artillery pieces. Uh, you could do that with a turret or without a turret, but there is some in, there are some indications that R35s were used to tow artillery. Um, did you see that question now? Are there, yeah. is there any evidence that 21st Pans are using these? Or are we going to come to that later? Uh, I can address this one right now so we can move on that. Uh, uh, basically, no. Uh, the general consensus is that these were uh, withdrawn just before D-Day. Uh, the, the parts where they were in were typically uh, transferring to Panzer Force, but we'll talk about that later. And uh, there's another, uh, there's a few which had a slightly different role, which may have been there, but there's at this stage, I looked into it uh, in preparation for the show, and there's still no evidence that they were actually used. But if a few were used in observation role, uh, that's possible, but there's still no evidence for it. And at this stage, it's probably safe to say no. But, okay. Yeah. Uh, this is the same uh, stretch of road. Uh, the photographs actually taken in more or less the same place. What we're seeing here are uh, our Hotchkiss tanks. Uh, this is uh, the the better of the the French light tanks. This one's better than a, than a Renault, basically. Uh, this is also the version with a uh, with a slightly longer gun. Um, and this is the type uh, one of which was knocked out at Lafayette as well. Although this is more or less in the area of Lisieux. Uh, this is the other, uh, this is the 205 uh, uh, tank battalion instead of the 206th, which was stationed at the Cap de la Arc, uh, west of Cherbourg, so all, all the way in right. the, the upper left corner of the of, of Normandy. And this is a sister unit. So this, I usually use this one, uh, this unit, this photo, these photos to illustrate how these were organized. And what we're basically seeing here is uh, probably a, com uh, uh, a company on the, on the, on the road, uh, with uh, with a with a few platoons, and just a bit difficult to see, but possible no difficulty. The one in the background uh, could be uh, could be another. Yeah, the one yeah the one behind it might well be uh somewhere, but it's yeah it's probably somewhere. So that's yeah, that's 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 com that's uh, that's a company on, on on the road, and this is also a, a very nice uh, then and now you can do with this particular location. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's uh, that's the French armor, yeah. And this is uh, when we start when we're moving over to the to the to the Panzer divisions. This is a very nice example of a of a Panzer IV. Great color photo. This one belonged to the Panzer division. Uh, you can see the the numbers on the on the side on the skirts on the turret, which means basically fourth uh, fifth company, first platoon, fourth vehicle. Um, and this one is uh, yeah. This, this photograph surfaced uh, a couple of years ago. And this is just a great example of, of a Panzer IV in Normandy. Yeah, it's a great photo. Yeah, really good. Um, yeah, this. Oh, yeah, this is a nice one. Uh, we were talking uh, earlier about the R35s with a with a Czech uh, 47 millimeter gun. Well, this is one of those. And these uh, this, these are also actually the vehicles that that we have seen in in the numbers. Uh, the five that belong to the, of were available to the, the 709th Infantry Division. They had five, and they transferred these to another fair, a rather obscure unit to most people, uh, Sch uh, Schnelle Brigade 30, 
Fast Brigade, basically 30, uh, which was essentially a training formation which had three uh, battalions uh, of bicycle troops uh, with some motorization. And one of their uh, battalions had in one of its companies these five vehicles. And this one was lost uh, quite shortly after D Day uh, in the American sector uh, behind Omaha Beach. Yeah, and near Littery. Is there another then now? You yeah. can do a good then and now yeah. there. Yeah, it's near, yeah Littery. A bit near Molly, Molly Littery, Littery. It's there. You can find that little um, shrine there very easy these days. Yeah. The hedge has changed, I think, but, the, but yeah, the road is the same. Yeah, and this is, uh, well, this is one of the examples of the Germans using captured French chassis and putting a gun on them, putting a new yeah. sub superstructure on them. Uh, and these particular vehicles are quite interesting also. And if you remove the, the, the superstructure and you can, you can, uh, you can see that they widen, they remove the turret race. They cut up, out the side just to make more room for it. And uh, one of the Renaults they currently have at the, the museum in Saumur is actually has has that modification. It's an ex uh, tank hunter basically. And if you oh. know where to look for it, so if if you ever make it there, look look compare the the different uh, R35s they have, and you you can see the differences. Yes, this is one of my favorite all time favorite photos. This is the area of, uh, I'm researching the Cotentin, this, uh, and what we're seeing here is a graveyard. Uh, this is August 1944. Uh, German lost vehicles have been gathered by, by the Americans, uh, either for redistribution to possibly the French, but basically to, to keep, to keep, to tie things up. Uh, it's obviously staged because there's, what, what, what the hell they're doing is, uh, is, a, is a bit bizarre. And you can, what you can see here is a great collection of vehicles. The one in the front is one of these ex-tank uh, tank hunters. Uh, so that's a, that's a great, uh, great link. Uh, and then behind it, you have uh, various types of, uh, of Hotchkiss tanks, uh, Renaults. And there's also hidden in the background uh, a Martyr uh, H, which, uh, which is the, the gun, basically the one with the, with the, with with the big gun, that's a, that's a, that's another Martyr 3H, of an H, and yeah, and if you go to the extreme upper right corner, yeah, you have a very weird looking object uh, to the edge, yeah, and that's uh, that's a wood gas generator. So that's oh, a, right. there's a, yeah, there's a there's a training tank uh, uh, down there, and then uh, yeah, if you look, uh, there's a sort of a mushroom shape in the in the just in the upper right center now just to, to the left the left that that yeah, that thing that's uh that's a Renault FT from the first world war mm. so wow. what we're what we're seeing here is a very motley collection of german vehicles lost in this particular sector of normandy you can see the trench skits sticking out of some of the vehicles some uh, some of the french tanks have short barrels some have long barrels that's also a way to to identify certain units because the training unit i was talking about uh, has their Hotchkiss tanks only have long barrels, whereas the other, the 206 Battalion, uh, also had uh, short barreled guns. So that's one way, assuming again that they didn't change things before the invasion and without the records. Uh, I'm assuming yeah. they didn't, but in this case, you, you just never know. So this is, this is the American sector, one part of it, and this photo is another part of the American sector. This is far more illustrative of what uh, the Allies were facing in the Calvados. This is a uh, uh, vehicle collection point uh, near isigny sur mer And what we're seeing here is basically heavy arm, or well, much heavier armor than uh, what we're seeing on the Cotentin with the French tanks and the obsolete uh, other types. Now, here in the front, we have two Panther tanks. Uh, the 425 is very typical style for, of the Panzerleer division. Uh, uh, one of the divisions we're going to talk about later. Yeah, absolutely obvious. Also on the on the turret head, you can also see the the numbers. So that's yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And the uh, the vehicle behind it, the the eight and uh, eight nine eight, is a is probably a co uh, a company uh, commander's vehicle from uh, from Das Reich, the second SS Panzer division. And in and be in between these two vehicles is a uh, Stuk four, a, 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 a Type for assault gun, uh, yeah, which belongs yeah. to the 17th SS Panzer Division or Panzer Grenadier Division, and the, the Panzer IV you're seeing here uh, is also second uh, second uh, SS. And in front of it, you have a a, a lovely uh, 251 uh, armored of a self-propelled 
sorry, uh, Schützenpanzerwagen, uh, basically armored personnel carriers, yeah, yeah. which were which were quite common. And uh, so that so you can see the differences uh, between the different sectors. The Covenant has very little uh, heavy uh, heavier armor. It's especially in the first month. At some point, we see the arrival first of the basically of the second SS Panzer Division, which starts to getting getting involved between Carantan and Perrier. And to the east, uh, in, in July, they insert the, the Panzerlehr Division to deal with the, uh, with, with the advance basically of uh, the, the US 19th uh, Army Corps, uh, which is being countered. And that's when they're starting to bring up the, and that's, that's those particular units are the first time Panthers and Panzer Force are starting to appear uh, west of, uh, of uh, Senlo, basically. So everyone said, every source claiming Tigers in that area, you don't even have to listen to them. It's light, and at, and at, even at, after that point, it's it's Panzer, Panzer Force or uh, or Panthers at some point. And there's a lovely description from a great book, uh, A Rifleman's War, which is an, a great account from a Ford infantryman. And at some point, he describes why he knows he, he faced a tiger, and he describes a Panzer IV. So that's, that's another illustration of what's going on. It doesn't take anything away from the book, but it's just do not expect uh, think what can i expect from this particular source and if it and just have just have your doubts about things like that and it doesn't take uh, and, away anything and generally the british and american tank recognition was appalling at this point of the war i mean that they yeah. they kind of know tiger but as you say they get that wrong half the time anyway mm. and ever, ever you know mm. other than that you know that first photo of all the different types of marders and that you can completely understand why identifying Marder 1s, Marder 2s, Marder 3s, Stug 3s, Stug 4s was of very little importance. If you're a sergeant in an infantry unit, all you cared about was killing Germans and moving on and not being killed. So it has left us with a real dearth of accurate information. But as we found out, you are finding stuff from your own, from the, from the archive. So we're time to move on now to the the, 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 the big boys, the, the armor divisions and 21st Panzer, um, because we're we're an hour and a bit in, so we're going to cover Pan, uh, 21st Panzer, 12th SS, and Panzer Lear. They're the ones yep. that you talked about earlier as being, in the case of Panzer, uh, 21st Panzer, very close to the beaters. And the other two, they're kind of both within striking distance. So 21st Panzer, let's talk about that. Um, and this is the unit that we famously know started engaging our lives behind Swords and Juno Beach. But this is uh, uh, another bit of fantastic documentary document graph you've got there so explain what you could glean from this document Niels. yeah i think it's just important to first understand what what, what are we seeing here this is how a german uh, div division is usually presented uh, this particular one is from june 1st 1944 so shortly before the invasion and what we're seeing here on the top right you have a panzer regiment a tank regiment on the upper left we have the uh, the, the panzer grenadier regiments two of them uh, you, and you can see each of these has two infantry uh, com of battalions. Uh, and one of the interesting bits is you can see that uh, below the, yeah. Uh, in each case, the one on the right, you can see that underneath these, these four uh, vertical columns, there's a symbol of a half track, basically. One wheel and tracks. So that's an armored infantry battalion. And you can see it also at the, the first battalion of the other regiment. And the other one is has, has just small circles, which means it, it's a motorized uh, battalion. So that's what you can see from there. And we'll, we'll take it. Uh, if you zoom out, we can continue with the other units. Uh, yes, then below the Panzer regiment, we are seeing uh, a Panzer Aufklärungsabteilung, uh, a tank recon armored reconnaissance battalion, basically, uh, to the left of. Now let's look at them first. It, it has basically two companies with armored cars, or at least one is on half track. So that's it's a slightly different version, but it's reconnaissance uh, half tracks. And then we have uh, basically more half tracks and and uh, and, and some uh, that are just wheeled. Now to the left we have Panzerjäger Abteilung 200. Uh, uh, that, that's the that's their anti-tank battalion, which in this case are towed uh, 88 uh, millimeter anti-tank guns. Uh, to the left, we have a very peculiar unit, uh, Sturmgeschützabteilung uh, 200, uh, assault gun battalion uh, 200, which you normally you would expect this uh, unit to be equipped with, uh, with Sturmgeschütz assault guns. 
but that's not quite the case here. But we'll we'll come back to those later. Just to to first to finish what we're, what we're seeing here. Um, yeah, where the where where the mouse is right now. Uh, that's the uh, tank art, art, armored artillery regiment, uh, and to the left we have a flak unit. And uh, at the bottom uh, we have other units. We have engine engineers on the right, uh, signals, communication, yeah. and and, that, and replacement battalion. And and at the bottom row it's 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 support units basically. So that yeah. that's that's what we're seeing here. And this is how the Germans typically uh, showed how units were organized, what kind of equipment they had, and these are gold mines. But it can also be a, a bit of a minefield if you if you don't really know what you're looking at and if you know don't take into account certain developments. And there was a question earlier about uh, the somewhat uh, tanks. And if we zoom in on the on the the pencil regiment, we can also see what what that what that is is about. No, to the right. To the right. Yeah, that's the pencil regiment. So what we can see here is. A situation where we have basically a regimental staff and we have two battalions. Uh, the one on the right is as numbers below it, below the the, the rhomboids, 17 Panzer Force, each of them, and it says LG, which stands for Lang, Long, and uh, Long Tank Guns. So these are pretty much standard uh, 1944 Panzer Force. Uh, now, if we look to the other battalion. Things look quite a bit different. Yes, they also have some long barrel Panzer IVs, but they also have so, some uh, some other types. Uh, we see SO, which stands for Somwa, which is the S35 we're, we're talking about, and also even has uh, two HOs, which stands for Hotchkiss. So we are having a battalion which has quite a considerable number of French tanks just before the invasion. But here's the thing: these were basically placeholders. This battalion was supposed to transfer not to a Panther, uh, a pa pa a Panzer IV, uh, to a Panzer IV battalion, whereas a normal regiment uh, has, uh, has various options. Uh, so what we're seeing here is we're seeing French tanks, we're seeing modern German tanks, and we're also seeing, and on the on the completely to the left, we're seeing short barrel Panzer IV. So another uh, type of outdated uh, vehicles. Uh, and if we can look at uh, at the top, we can also see uh, some more somewhere with with the regimental staffs, the uh, HQ companies. So we have a mixed bunch. And the problem is uh, this division was still getting armor at the time uh, of the invasion. Uh, it had been sent 14. Uh, the Panzerleer division uh, had sent it 15 of its own vehicles. Uh, that reason is. Uh, is interesting in itself, but they had more vehicles, and they sent some of them that those hadn't arrived uh, on at this particular date. The sh some of them are shown later with markings of that particular Panzerleer division in the context of the uh, of the 21st Panzer division. So that's also an interesting. Uh, when you see a photo, usually you can identify what's going on, but in this case, you see something you don't quite expect. But if, if you look closer into the archives and some people uh, have, that, have studied these units ve uh, very closely, I'm sort of piggybacking off them. And this, these are records I do have. So I'm taking a, taking a look at them for you tonight. But it's it's a very complicated, it can be very complicated. Just if this unit had 29 vehicles on the way at the moment, Panzer Force on the way on the moment that this particular document was made. So it doesn't mm. it doesn't give a full impression. So at the time of the invasion, some of these at least had arrived. Some may have been shifted around. So the second battalion, which had all the French tanks, uh, was starting the transformation to get more uh, Panzer Force. And you can also see some some. Uh, some of these units uh, leaving probably already of some of these French tanks leaving probably to already to make room for tanks that they that were on their way. So just because they had them on June first doesn't mean they went into action. And actually, the general consensus is that they were pulled out uh, and not uh, sent into the uh, sent in because also the terrain itself you might be able to pull off using these on the Cotentin, but. Uh, in this particular sector of Normandy, the situation is quite a bit different. So, uh, and they these were probably kept uh, uh, more uh, closer to Falaise, and they were not sent into action. That's the, the most logical estimates we can make at this particular time. So, two two points I'm making is one is 
if I was researching this and I found this document and it had all these vehicle types listed and I ran away with that thinking, hey, I've got all these vehicles types listed, I now know I would be wrong because, as you said, some of these are placeholders and they're being replaced. So that's the, the first point is, is that a lot of researchers and historians haven't even had access to these documents. And if they have, there's another level of information that you've got to go to, to, to get through this placeholder replacement thing. And, as, and I also want to address Scott Grimwood's point there that replacing vehicles is also the issue of training and familiarity with those vehicles. You know, you've been using something French and then something new comes along and the, the battle is the next day. That doesn't lend itself to being efficient if you've only got that vehicle the day before. I mean, just forget the spare parts, forget the ammunition. The familiarity is a, is a huge issue. Um, yeah. You know, if you, if you were to look at a similar British or American armor division at this point, there'd be a lot less variety of vehicles, a lot less variety of weaponry, and they'd have been pretty much familiar with it for a good few a good few weeks, if not months. So, yeah, that's a couple of points there. But um, I'll let you keep on going about 21st Panzer. Yeah, but 21st Panzer Division is the most bizarre, uh, quite probably the most bizarre division uh, the Germans ever constructed. Uh, it's full of uh, converted French vehicles. Uh, we talked about just French tanks at, to, up to this point, but they're loaded with vehicles that were uh, built uh, in Paris in other uh, uh, in other states by by Baustab Becker, which is quite famous. He's also the commander of the of the Stungeschutz Abteilung here, and they had a variety of vehicles that is just very difficult to comprehend, even if you if you look at look at it. They took French uh, half tracks. They they. They put heavy anti-tank guns on them. They put rows of mortars on them. We have photos of them, so it might be uh, we might be able might be a good moment to to look at a few of those. Uh, so this is a very bizarre unit that that is fascinating when you when you look closer at it. And this is a this is a pen, nice Panzer four. So let's let's look at a couple of these twenty first Panzer photos because with the, the, these you sent to a couple. So that's yeah, great photo of Panzer four there. Yeah, um, I think this one is salt as but it doesn't really matter. But it, this is a great view of a of a of a Panzer, of Panzer IV, uh, the, the most an uh, an H version, uh, great uh, solid yeah. tank, uh, not 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 perfect, but it's had its own problems. But this is the the this has been the backbone of the German uh, arm arm uh, Panzer forces. Uh, for ma for many years now, especially yeah. since 44, 43 that started. Uh, yeah, this is an inspection tour of Rommel, who did uh, an incredible number of inspection tours. And what we're seeing here is the assault gun battalion of the 21st Panzer Division. Uh, the vehicle we're seeing in the, here in the background is a 105 millimeter howitzer based on a Hotchkiss uh, chassis. You can even see the name Hotchkiss uh, between the between the uh, the soldiers. Yeah. Uh, this is one of those particular conversions, uh, quite quite rare, um, almost exclusively, or all of them uh, ended up in this particular unit, and that's uh, so that's how they made use to create their own self-propelled guns uh, by this uh, this organization, which was basically converting uh, vehicles, which is in itself fascinating. And uh, if you have, if you can get it. There's a great uh, overview of, of the vehicles in this particular book. This is an old one, but it should still be around in, uh, in updated prints, I think. And if you can't uh, try to get this one if you find this interesting, because there's a great amount of information in it. Right. Yeah, this this is basically the, the other version of this that same combination, but this is the uh, the direct anti-tank version. This has a Pac-40 anti-tank gun, and otherwise, a, the, it's a different type of gun, so the design is a, is a little different, but it's the same idea. These are these were grouped together in batteries in this uh, in this particular uh, uh, battalion, uh, and these are yeah these are more Bundesagi photos, which give a very good impression of how, of how these things looked. And this is basically uh, another uh, French tank chassis with a with a powerful uh, Pac-40 anti-tank gun on it. And how much going back to what you said earlier about von Rundstedt and this idea about having mobile mobile forces? How much of this creation of these types of self-propelled guns is directly coming from von Rundstedt's uh, directions? Well, much of this is uh, this construction of these vehicles has been going on for quite some time. And some have been have started in 1941, 1942, 1943. Uh, it, when they, the predecessor of the rebuilt, basically, 21st Panzer Division, which was destroyed in, in North Africa, uh, was a so-called Schnelle Brigade West, which was gathering uh, 
at, the, at its peak, it was about 1,800 basically French vehicles. Uh, that includes motorcycles, but it includes a massive amount of half tracks, uh, modified vehicles, a lot of the modified vehicles. So they're basically these workshops are building basically from captured French material, they're building a panzer division. And that's that's in itself, and that was then used to, to build this particular division, which also explains why this division existed at all. Mm -hmm. Because it's such a bizarre collection of vehicles. Um, and look, it's it's interesting to, to look further into the, the background of that particular unit, but uh, we, we, we go on for hours. Yeah. There's other people, and I have a friend who's who's actually writing also the 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 the, the, the text uh, the the question at the bottom. Um, I have a friend who's really specialized in 21st Panzer Division, and um, last time we talked at this at length, there is there there's quite there's quite a few issues with with the uh, with the Carlton House book. It it's good for what it is, but it's uh, basically what I'm sort of doing for the content and this, this friend of mine is doing for this particular division. So that's, uh, uh, that's a question that's more, uh, more, yeah. more, for, more up, up to him, but it's, it sounds uh, like it's, it's good for what we have now, but it can be improved upon. As yeah. Is the case with most and of the, issues, really. Yeah. And, and that's also what you were making a point about, uh, German documents. It's very important always to realize what are we looking at? And if it's for June 1st, 1944, it is for, basically June 1st, 1944, it might be different on D-Day. And it's the difference are not going to be massive, but they can still be significant. If if a batch of, of 12 or 14 or 15 tanks arrived, it things change. change so, yeah. yeah. So in general, uh, the overall picture of a division doesn't really change, but a regiment or a battalion can change quite significant in strength in a few days. So as long as you keep that in mind and you say, this document says this for this particular, and it doesn't say more than that. And sometimes it doesn't even say what the document seems to say, but that's the, the things we uh, we discussed in, uh, in things that are changing. This yeah. is a, uh, a fantastic example of Germans uh, repurposing a French non-armored, uh, uh, this is a, uh, the heavier uh, Samoa uh, half track. They put on an armored superstructure and they put on uh, 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 rocket launchers, basically. And this is one of those vehicles, which is a great example of for what's going on uh, on an overview of a particular unit. Because we are still not 100% sure where these were used by the 21st Panzer Division. There's some indication uh, that linked them to, uh, to, the, to the artillery regiment. There's some units who say, no, they were in the assault gun uh, battalion and... and as far as I understand, my friend at this point believes the evidence is stronger to them being used with the uh, with the assault gun battalion, but that's not it's not my forte. I I, I can't really say anything. Mm -hmm. But this mm -hmm. is one of those things we know they had them, and when you look at the overview at the chart, it's not clear where these are. And that's uh, that's also just one more example of how our document doesn't say everything. Yeah, uh, and and. And you've got about as far as anybody has going through this, but there's still these huge question marks. There's huge gaps. There's there's riddles still to solve. And 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 to, is it fair to say that of the divisions we're talking about, so we're twenty first uh, and the twelfth SS and the and the um and, and the Panzerlier is the twenty first is the most complicated of those three. Yeah, it's, it, I think it's the most complicated uh, German Panzer division ever. And yeah. it's it's. What I've been doing for the entire code, and uh, you can do, you can you can keep yourself busy for years just studying this particular division, and you still want to know the answers. And which, this, is, it, which also explains why so much misinformation is written. You've written, and you know, when I consider the books I have on the British Sixth Airborne, for example, and I've got quite a lot of them, the references to Twenty First Panzer are either vague or they don't. Make, they just say we're knocking out anti tank guns or we're knocking out self propelled guns. Sure. It's because the information just hasn't been available for you, or it hasn't been readily available. It hasn't been easy to access. Uh, uh, well, now it's getting easier. Yeah. yeah, and and I mean, we're now talking about things that are pretty well documented. But there's also plenty, when you look at operational level and the, the actual fighting, it can be incredibly difficult to find any German reports on a on, a, on an action that the, the Allies found quite significant or, or vice versa. But it's uh, there's just a lot... Uh, that's just a lot we we will never know and that's also something yeah. we need to accept and we need to find a balance on how to approach this and if you make a claim 
explain why, what you're basing it on. And I, I have no problem if people do solid research and say, I can't answer this question, or I, I suspect this is what happened, but we don't know. And based on this evidence, I, I think this. And But that's as long as you're clear about what you know and what you don't know and what's speculative and, it, and what's the reasons for that behind that speculation, uh, just be clear why you're why you're saying yeah right i mean we're just taking up other shows a, a a statement isn't it's an assertion until you can prove it it's yeah. so you can say i believe this was this but until you have evidence to support it it's only an assertion it's when start people using assertions as facts it becomes a bit more complicated it's it's fine for historians to say we don't know and in this case my guess is it is this that i've done that with some of my own writing and stuff and talking in the past but it's when you when you when you guess and you a guess becomes a fact is very dangerous, tricky, tricky ground. So yeah. um, I and think we should move on to 20, uh, yeah. 12 SS Neils now, yeah. and then we can go yeah. back and address some other questions. But yeah, that's um, okay. this is the famous unit that, that, that was involved uh, behind Juno Beach on June 7th. But they are, as we explained earlier, they are in the in the Lisieux kind of area. They're, they're not far from the beaches. So how was their makeup fairly consistent for a, for a, for a SS Panzer Division? Yeah, that they've been forming for quite some time since, uh, yeah, a long time since second half of 1943, I believe. Uh, and like all SS Panzer divisions, they start out as a SS Panzer Grenadier division. The other division, all the divisions had transi uh, transitioned towards uh, the Panzer Grenadier level, um, but in this particular case, that's also uh, that's that's also what happens. And what we're seeing here is uh, basically the when they decided to upgrade this division to a Panzer division, as they were doing with other uh, SS uh, Panzer Pen uh, Grenadier divisions, this is the the theoretical organization they were planning for. So what you can see here, particularly if you look at the at the, uh, at the, at the tank regiment, you can see one battalion with with Panzer fives, Panthers, and you have one which which is mixed with Panzer fours and Sturmgeschütze which is also quite common uh, among other units. Even uh, some of the SS units that fought in Normandy still had uh, Schumgeschütze in their 7th and 8th company. I think the 9th and maybe old, uh, uh, 9th and 10th SS uh, were, uh, were either this or one of them. Uh, so you can see that kind of a development in, in how they were organized. And also one thing that's interesting is because these were Panzer Grenad originally Panzer Grenadier divisions, they already had three infantry battalions in their uh, Panzer Grenadier regiments, which other divisions that were purposely built from the ground up as a Panzer division at this stage of the war. Uh, the, ar the regular army, the Heer divisions, only had two. And in Normandy, you can really say that having an additional infantry battalion is really helpful. Uh, and this is also something where, for instance, if you look at the, the failed counterattack of the Panzer Division uh, in July 1944 uh, uh, in the Le Désert area, they they basically lose an infantry battalion, which is kind of cat catastrophic if you have already suffered losses and you only have uh, four of them to begin with. So that that's really an issue. And in Norman Normandy is as much an inf or even more, it's far more an infantry battle you could say, in a battle of infantry attrition than it is uh, than it is about tanks, which is also why it's nice to do this particular show. But don't forget the the infantry and the artillery is at least as important as the tanks. Although in the area around Caen there's a slightly different balance. But if you don't have the infantry, you're going to get uh, yeah you you'll burn out either way. And what the what the Allies did really well is they kept these divisions busy. They they trained them, and when the German uh, Infantry divisions came in to, to, re to finally replace these Panzer divisions because Panzer divisions, they're, mo they're supposed to be mobile. They're supposed to deliver a punch. They're not supposed to hold a line. And you could say the problem of the Germans was that they didn't have enough Panzer divisions, but maybe they should have looked far harder into getting proper infantry battalion uh, divisions uh, because they can, hold, they can also hold the line and then you can free them up and their focus on Panzer Division is an interesting one. You can also argue that there was problems, they already had enough problems raising the divisions they had, which is also true. But it's, if we just focus on, on they didn't have enough armor, well, they didn't have enough infantry as well. So it, it's it's always far more complicated than, than people, uh, than the easy version uh, is. So 
take that into account. And this is one of the things that SS Panzer divisions in Normandy had an edge over their over their uh, here infantry divisions or here Panzer divisions. But it's not like they were more elite or they built extra uh, material. Uh, so it, uh, the deliveries is not. If you look at the entire picture, it's not uh, really for the entire certainly for the entire war that the SS had a privileged position with better better equipment and more of it. It's just it depends on the circumstances. But it's it's I think it's important to realize and the Panzer divisions of the here are very interesting as well. So people should stop looking just at the SS units. Yeah, this is an in, uh, this is an interesting one. Uh, yeah, let me see. Yeah, this is basically the the theoretical organization. This is the Sol, which is the, the which they were supposed to have in uh, yeah ultra strength. And then you can see the different types of tanks, Panzer three, Panzer four, 25, and, and, and Tigers even in here. And then you have, uh, and the, the, the last column has uh, self-propelled anti-tank guns, which is, uh, which is also interesting in this particular case. Uh, Panzer four, Panzer threes in this particular case is mainly observation uh, vehicles and command vehicles. Uh, Panzer fours are pretty much what it says. Uh, Panthers are pretty much what it says. And as you can see, uh, there's Panzer IVs are close to authorized strength, but they're still having quite a, a shortage of, 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 of Panthers, actually. And some of them have already been, uh, been are on their way to them, but it's it's not like this division was had all of the video. This is June 1st again. They weren't fully equipped uh, uh, at this particular time. And if you look at the... Uh, at the self-propelled anti-tank guns, which is a bit of a combination in this time, uh, you can see they only have 13 of those, one of which is in repair, uh, and these are nine uh, of the mod of the modern uh, Jagd Panzer IV, which is uh, basically a, a tank that the, the, uh, the Panzer IV-based uh, tank hunter, which became uh, was introduced later in the war and later even got a heavier gun, but this one is still. Uh, Similar, basically, to to uh, a bit sleeker uh, assault gun. Uh, yes, Otmar, I can see your message. I'll uh, I'll reach out to you, or you can reach out to me on Twitter or something else. Uh, anyway, uh, but what they also had, they had three martyrs, which is not something they were supposed to have at this stage of the war anymore. But they still had three, and that's an, those are another example of vehicles that get moved around. They were initially in the anti-tank uh, battalion, and later in the campaign, they ended up in the in the reconnaissance battalion, I believe. So that's also, you can have them on a list, but when they go into action and in a few days later, the situation can again be different. So that's also something, uh, that's another point to illustrate that when, when we see here uh, self-propelled anti-tank guns, it's two different vehicles in several different units and one of these groups gets moved around even. So keep in mind, but. The, the advantage of an image like this is you see what they had on this particular day. You can see how many are in repair, how many are operational, and how many they are still lacking at the, at that moment. And this is a, a great example. Also note the the second column from the right. These uh, these are uh, armored personnel carriers. These are uh, armored cars. These are artillery observing uh, observation vehicles. Uh, so this gives a great example of what we're talking about today: armor. Uh, which is why also one of the reasons why these kind of overviews are uh, are quite neat to 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 assess uh, a specific division. Uh, yes, this is the the actual uh, June first uh, uh, overview. Uh, this one is is a bit more vertical uh, approach, but it's uh, basically still uh, still the same type of elements we have already seen in the in the twenty first uh, of Panzer Division. In this case, uh, however, you can see there is no uh, assault uh, battalion, assault gun battalion. Uh, so there's some differences between units, but this is uh, the assault gun battalion is basically if it, some Panzer divisions had had it, still had them, but it's basically uh, a unit that was supposed to transition to to anti uh, more uh, yacht panzer and more purposely built anti tank guns. So it was sort of an in interim solution that sort of in most cases. Uh, Originated from 1943 and, and was being uh, phased out. You can also see that in the case of the of das Reich, they arrived with a uh, with an assault gun battalion, which is renamed during the fighting, basically as an uh, as an anti tank battalion. And this particular uh, example uh, 
shows a division that's quite in organization is quite close to to what was intended but there are still some 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 interesting differences yeah this is a pencil division this is a truly uh, also uh, a rather fascinating uh, unit um, this one is their theoretical organization and one of the things you can already uh, look at in this particular case is are the infantry regiments instead of having one uh, battalion which was standard on uh, which was self to be self-propelled on half tracks this one has four all four of them are equipped with uh, with with half tracks uh, so they're fully motorized uh, and that's how they these particular units are uh, are equipped which is one of the anomalies this one has this particular stage of this overview which is what this theoretical overview they were still thinking of having 22 uh tanks in each uh in each tank company which they later uh referred uh, their standard approach became 17 panzer uh, uh panthers and and the 22 Panther force that sort of that sort of remained. So there's a there's a development there, and this is how they I felt that this should be the ideal organization. And there is a, uh, what you can see in infantry divisions, which differed in theoretical organization from 1943 to 1944, is also something you can see in Panzer Panzer Grenadier divisions and also in Panzer divisions. Uh, the 44 and the 43 are 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 different at certain points. And you can also have a combination where the organization of the tank regiment uh, is a type 44 unit whereas the especially the the reconnaissance element is a uh, is still following the, the 1943 rules and if it, and in some cases this change this organization again changes while they're already engaged in normandy in the summer of 1944 then they start to change over so what you can see is there, there are always changes you need to take into account, but these overviews are still great to get an understanding of what was intended, uh, how it was in this, and then was probably the next one in 1940 uh, on June 1st. Yeah, this is June 1st. And so you so you can still see what, what has changed in, in between, where, where there's problems and where they're uh, starting to deviate from a previous plan, either because the unit they're absorbing uh, had a different organization or because they simply have changed their mind on what how was uh, organization should be at the time because of new doctrine or because of uh, supply difficulties uh, so that's what, uh, what we're seeing here and this one is yeah basically uh, again the same kind of overview of the of the different units we have uh, at the top we have the the the, the tank regiment, which in the case of the 20 uh, uh, Panzer Division was a bit problematic because their first uh, battalion uh, was not actually available. Instead, they used uh, Panzer Regiment 6, uh, which which took over the role of, uh, of the intended uh, first uh, battalion, which was also, but there was also a Panther battalion, and we have already seen uh, some of their uh, wrecks in the in the in the photograph of the yeah. Yeah, so that's that's one of the things that's uh, that's a peculiar detail about uh, the Panzer Regiment of the Panzerleer Division, and basically, uh, yeah, those are the, the the defining characteristics of of these particular units. Uh, let me see if there's anything. No, I don't think there's a whole, whole lot more what we can say about this one. This is again the overview of the of the numbers. This one is a bit complicated because this one includes uh, an end an. Uh, a radio controlled unit uh, which sort of messes with, uh, with 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 some of the numbers uh, as you can see uh i'll just jump to the thing that's the most important there's tigers on this list yeah finally we get tigers yeah yeah yeah, yeah that's panzer force uh some of these are uh are panzer twos uh Königstiga, king tigers or whatever you want to call them the tiger uh, b uh, but uh there's six on this list Oh, there's actually eight on this list there's, there's two in the pair five of these are are, are, are these uh, new tanks these new tiger twos these didn't make it to normandy these were left at the uh, chateau d'un where they were ultimately captured by the americans and then there's the issue of the three tigers which is still debated to this day where did they go and if there's any chance uh, the americans encountered tigers before sometimes in o august they may have come with this division and there is there's one photo for uh which is it's, it's very rare it's part of the collection which might show a tiger in a in the u.s sector but that's this is this is one for the tiger lovers this is still an 
a topic is being debated and there's still no uh, clear cut answer to this one. But that's the only way there may have been uh, tigers uh, facing American troops in, in July, still not June, July 44. And what we are seeing here is a unit that's that's really, uh, really strong at this particular moment. You can see the Panzer Force very close to authorized strength yeah. and the number of and the number of Panthers is actually over authorized strength. Yeah. So, yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah. So this this is this is very rare, but in this particular case, that that was the case. I, I haven't looked into a, a proper explanation for this. There might be various reasons, but uh, this is an this is a division that when you look at its armor, it's as close to authorized strength as basically any division that that arrived in in Normandy. This is it doesn't get better than this basically. We've seen the we've seen the so-called elite uh, Hitler youth, which which you can question on a whole lot of accounts. You can even see that that division uh, was short of uh, of it of armor, and this one is is very close to to that particular level. And it does beg the question why we why people don't talk about Panzerlehr very much. Where the Twelfth SS and we were, we was on Twitter, wasn't it? Was there's two books coming out this year on the Twelfth SS. I haven't. I don't remember a book on the Panzerlehr for, for some time, you know, an English language kind of generic book. There's lots of specialist vehicle books, but it's that obsession with certain units. We'll come on in a minute, Niels, we'll come on to your kind of biggest things that piss you off that get written about German armor and Normandy. But yeah, Panzerlehr to me, seeing that strength there, it, it completely demonstrates why they were a very effective unit for a few weeks in Normandy. I mean, you look at all the fighting around that they're involved in Tilly, Tilly Sursal and, and that front there, they were a very effective unit. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's a fascinating uh, unit to, to research, and the, people's obsession with with the Hitler Youth. I don't I don't get it. Uh, this one is, uh, I, I think all un, all units allied and German are are interested to some extent. Uh, for a lot of are far more interesting when you when you start looking into them than than you might ever expect. Uh, that's the same for 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 this one. Uh, and about all the books coming out, um, well, there there have been some good researched books with with new documents about the 12th SS. They've been published about five years ago, I believe. And I'm pretty sure that that gave a new impulse for for well, a bit lazier researchers to to follow where that where they, that research for that new books came from, and then uh, take advantage of it and and come up with with their own ones. Yeah. Uh, so, so I think that's that's one of the issues, and then people think, well, I can I can use that, and that and that's that's true, and and it, and it sells because that's the name Hitler in it, and it is, and there's sort of a mythical uh, image in it. Yeah. But when you, I mean, you you, you uh, with Mike Bechtold, you you this, this summer you discussed uh, the fighting of the division against the Canadians, and they. Got and we we'll do it again this time. We're going to do more stuff about the twelfth. Yeah, so and Andy Pandelaire as well this year, hopefully. Yeah. But it, but it, but just what his research already is was so, and people who haven't watched it just go back, look at it, and and you can get a far better understanding of what was going on. And and units that are perceived to be elite, what's actually elite about them is it, it's it's perception and how they like to portray themselves. And of course, after the war, you have the problem of the nastiest people trying to defend themselves the most vocally, yeah. which is also a serious a serious problem where other people think well it's time to move on that wasn't the best chapter in the history of this country and whereas the 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 people with the who have the most to defend and the most to to defend themselves who yeah have done the most uh, horrible things uh they have a reason to to be vocal and to sort of make excuses for themselves and of course the, the, there's no such thing as the clean wehrmacht or the clean hair uh, the luftwaffe uh, did uh, to admit Plenty of atrocities. Yeah, uh, everybody's so, culpable in some yeah, shape or form. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and and far and far more than people realize. So that's not even that's not even the problem. But we need to, when you look at, at the fighting and you try to separate that from from all the nastiness that that's basically you can't separate it from. But look at all the German units. If you look at that, look at all the Allied units because you. It's the only way to get a far better understanding of what was going on, what they were up against on both sides, uh, what problems they were facing. Uh, it, that's the, it's the best way to uh, to appreciate what the sacrifices made, what the efforts yeah. uh, put into it, and you you can never get a complete picture. And which is also one of the reasons I'm writing my book very much from a German perspective, just to create more balance. I know there's exactly. things to Germany. The Germans wrote that aren't are not correct. Uh, how they misunderstood or misassessed some things. Uh, I mean, one of the interesting things is how the Germans believe. Well, 
Rumsfeld says, well, there's stuff. I don't, we don't understand why the allies do it, but there's political reasons behind it. And you say, well, that's true to a point, but far less than the Germans uh, perceive. So it's also how the Germans look at, at what's going on. They were, they were seeing po politics in a different level than, than if you look at it from the Allied perspective. And of course, there, were, there was politics involved. But the German, it, uh, the more you know, the more you start to understand how one side viewed it and, and why, what choices they made. And sometimes they were wrong and sometimes yeah, they got and, it right. Um, we had comments earlier about has Neil studied the American and British sides? And of course you have as well, because even if you only get some information from that, it's all about rounding out the picture. It's all about comparing one version with another version, you know, and you wouldn't want people to think you've only just examined German archives and taken everything from there and not use the Allied side, that there's information to be taken from the Allied side, but but with caution and with, with, with cross-checking and looking at the photos. And then from all of that information, you can you can build together a proper picture. So Ally in order Allied, to... Sorry. Proper Allied, pro yeah. Proper Allied intelligence in, uh, gathered in Normandy, which varies quite a bit between different units, is incredibly important to realize what they were up against. And it's, yeah. and I mean, I, I know quite a few people who are very much into a specific division, both uh, both American, uh, British, Canadian. And when you start out, uh, yeah, I've got all, all these documents from them. Yeah, that's nice. And where's the intelligence? And it's something that's almost always at the bottom of the list. So there's people have plenty of information about what their guys were writing up and what they were, but not what they were facing. And that's something people should be far more aware that it's it shouldn't be on the bottom. It should be second or third thing to do because you need to know what what were what were my guys, so to speak, up against. Yeah. And well, that comes into that thing generally with history. It's like with teaching, is that you the teacher only needs to be one lesson ahead than the pupils to, in to some extent. And I think when people are writing about the Battle of Normandy, for example. As long as they know a bit more than the reader, then every, then it doesn't matter. The point is to be a really good historian, you've got to know a lot more than the reader so that you can then impart that information properly. But uh, it, it probably is therefore a good point, Neil, is to bring up the what are the most repeated myths that annoy you about the units we've talked about or the particular types of armor. I mean, I, for my takeaway from what you said tonight, I'm thinking about one of the things, even things I've said about 21st Panzer. So I've talked about the, the the variety of their vehicles, and I've looked at them in that point of view as maybe a weakness. And I've definitely heard people talk about the 12th SS as being elite, and Panzerlehr doesn't get a look in. So of those three units, I think there's some people make these sweeping statements because they're easy. Oh, 21st Panzer had too many different types of vehicles. Um, what what is so? What are your what are your annoying facts that you read all the time? The annoying the annoying things that you you go. Urgh. Uh, when it, if, modern, if modern publications still mention tigers in the U.S. sector, that's that's just uh, just shut up. By by now, everybody should know better. And, and I mentioned the only possible exception, which is a small except uh, chance even, but just that if you don't understand that basic level of what's going on, you really need to think: Am I going to write a book? Uh, so that that's that's one of the things. Um, the I don't really have a problem with people saying, "Well, they had so many different vehicles in the 21st Panzer Division." Well, as far as I know, there's not there's not a lot of complaints about um, being unreliable. One of the things that is a major problem for all, almost all German units is tires, hmm. rubber. Um, that that that's something people uh, tend to overlook, and which is. Even if you have modern vehicles, or good quality vehicles, because there were quite some units which which, which had been able to gather them from one source or another, and they say, well, it's it's all nice and good. Our vehicles are good, but we're losing 50% in a road march through punctures and, or tires being worn out. And that's that's something uh, that part of the logistics. It's it's not just about fuel. What people uh, keep focusing on. Uh, fuel is very important, uh, but there's also reports from Normandy where, where people say, well, fuel is not a problem. I mean, we're, we're, we're all in the front. We're, we're, we can move around as much as we want, so that, no, it's not a problem. Fuel sometimes gets a problem for the supply units, uh, but the units at the front uh, are not necessarily burning through a whole lot of fuel in partic unless there is a very heavy engagement where, with a lot of movement. Uh, so, so that's one of the things that it's it's all about balance. Everything plays a part, and it's all part of a bigger picture, which ultimately leads to the 
to to the German defeat in Normandy. Mm. But it's uh, people tend to focus on on one thing far too much and just try to understand the complexity. Uh, there's a lot of things playing playing a part. Uh, there's ammunition shortages, but not necessarily for 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 the uh, for the tanks is what we're talking about. But it's it's far more acute often for for the artillery, which is very uh, important when it when it comes to defeating enemy attacks or discouraging enemy attacks. So that so you can say, well, yeah, but they, they couldn't move around. And also one of the things that I really hate is. Uh, people tend to focus on German reported tank losses and German reported tank losses are deeply, deeply dishonest. And that's because of the German reporting system. Uh, a tank within three that's repairable within three weeks. We've seen it in the, in the, in the, the overviews of, of these units. Uh, they're listing them as, as being available within three, three weeks. And what is three weeks? Uh, how bad are they damaged? Uh, and there's also a tendency, well, they're not three weeks, but they're longer than three weeks, uh, but they're still repairable. Yeah, but who's going to repair them? Does that mean shipping them back to Germany? Uh, can they be repaired in the field? Can they be in the short period that Normandy lasts the, the campaign? I mean, it's three months, but it's if, if you have a tank that takes eight weeks to repair, yeah, what's, what's really yeah. the point? And if you look at uh, wrecked from the German retreat, you can see very damaged vehicles uh, on flatbeds being transported by train, and these are vehicles the Allies would not have bothered about. But these are not uh, written up as as actual losses. So you can, if you say, well, if the Germans tend to only if it's burned out or left on the battlefield beyond their uh, control, it's a total loss. It, I'm exaggerating, but that's basically what it is. So you get a very. The only thing that really matters in the end is how many operational tanks do you have. And that's also yeah. something people tend to overlook, especially uh, the Wehrmacht fanboys and the Panzer fanboys who say, well, they only lost so many tanks. Uh, yeah, but how many were operational after this this particular attack or operational the next day? Uh, so it, it's it's not about total losses. It's about how many tanks can you uh, can you field the next day or the next, next two days. It, uh, but not, well, the, 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 these are not combat losses or or not fully destroyed because we can repair them eventually somewhere, hopefully. And that's also what you see. We did the great show with Arthur about the Canadian um, logistics yeah. and that kind of triage system where the Canadians developed in Italy, where they could they would immediately identify whether a vehicle is repa repairable within within sort of 24 hours. And that's one category. If it's repairable within five days, that's another category. And they're really good at identifying it. So their breakdown of what is actually repairable and what is theoretically repair. I've got lots of things in my house that are theoretically repairable. <laughs> the question is, will I ever get round to actually doing it? Because it's a very different thing. So, yeah, so, so that's a very good point about, about the ease of repairing stuff. Um, and I guess well, the other thing I'm taking away from what you're saying is just these skills you've learned of, of, of dissecting these German documentation, taking them at first value, second value, the placeholder aspect, the reliability, the replacement fact, there's a lot to this. And, you know, this is 10 years work for you and you're still, you've still got more to do. So yeah. um, it's, is it frustrating to you? Well, that, that the authors are still misrepresenting the German forces in Normandy when they're, is now a better access to this information. I mean, I've you know we we you know you we between you and I we've made sure you've got in contact with a few authors and told them your work and your yep. findings and you know. But it, is it frustrating when people aren't aren't finding information that is that is there now? Uh, it it is uh, to a point. Uh, if if stuff is readily available, if it's been published by by well known authors, it, it, people should be more aware of it. Um, for instance, if people will still talk about the, the 352nd Infantry Division of the OMA as elite veterans from the Eastern yeah. Front, uh, I mean, there's there's so many errors in that single sentence. Uh, I just don't know what to say. But there is a, there is a lot of stuff that is uh, known to a relatively select uh, group of people, and it's still quite a substantial group. But if you're not at those at the right locations, because most people will never write a book. But there's a lot of knowledge out there uh, from a lot of people. I mean, uh, people that are interested, take a serious look at the Access History Forum if you're having certain questions. There's a lot of very fine people there who really look into the documents. 
there, there are people who have studied this professionally uh, at universities for armies for who knows what for many many decades sometimes so there's a lot of information but you need to uh, re reach out to them you need to find them and on the other part it's also a matter of making yourself more noticeable and i mean it's great that you're you're giving a lot of experts uh, who are or, or not very no, well known uh, a chance to talk about things because it's also a responsibility uh, to talk about these things if you know more about it which is also why i enjoy uh, coming on your show to, to talk about it because there is so much more out there and it's also about people who do know to educate the others if you just sit back and complain well they got that wrong and that uh, they should have known better try if you know something more about something well yeah they, Make it available. Uh, do not keep it in a very small group. Uh, write a small article somewhere, put it online, start a blog, do something, and people will start to pick it up. Yes, and there's a there's a good chance that people will rip off your research, uh, but just keep it online and people can always trace well, that's it. That's a very good point about from. people saying things are wrong. I, just today, uh, there, were, there was um, Matt, Moss, Matt Moss at Fighting on Film was talking about the film A Call to Spy, which I had Sarah Megan Thomas on last year talking about. And a couple of people on Twitter said, oh, it's all wrong. Everything in that film is wrong. It's all mm -hmm. wrong. So I just said, I'm, I'm not defending the film. or I'm just saying, so what's wrong with it then? And I don't get responses. And you think, well, okay, then you, you've made the claim that something's wrong. Now tell us what's wrong. Like that, that's, I get that occasionally on comments on, on emails. I get things like, the information, I had it with one, the Night of the Bayonets one about the, the, the fighting in Tex Tessel. Mm -hmm. someone said everything that was said by that guy was wrong i said so, so what was wrong i'm not gonna tell you but it was all wrong I said, okay well that's worthless then isn't it why why bother to tell me that if you haven't if you're not prepared to come through and deliver what it is you think is wrong and that's very frustrating if you've got something that you think is wrong then come out there and say it come out and say here here's what's got wrong you've got wrong and here's what i have got to prove what you've got is wrong but yeah so um it is complicated, but there is information out there. And I think the danger we're in is it's the sweeping statement that we're still victims of. And I yep. think in, the, in, in Twitter, for example, and it's happened to lots of popular historians, they make a little statement as part of a conversation and it gets taken out of context. And one little thing then becomes a fact they've made. And it might be, you know, we, we've all done things like, oh, you might make a sweeping statement, say that, I don't know, the, the Italian Navy wasn't very good in 1943 or something. And, and people go, oh, well, of course, it, what about this occasion? What about that? It's we've we've got to give time to go to levels of detail and not just take everything from these single single statements. There's always a level of nuance that we always keep coming back to that's important to discuss. So, um, well, yeah. Um, any final points you want to make as we're coming up the two hour mark, and we will have you on again, yeah. Neil, when your book comes out. And we will yeah. we should definitely do one of these about the infantry units, and I think maybe do one about artillery at some point as well. But given this is still really an overview about German army, yeah, armor is, and, armor, and we've, yeah. we've done two hours, it, it shows there's a lot of information out there if only people wanted to, to take the time to listen to it. Any final thing you want to say? Uh, no, not really. I think it, we, we covered some of the, uh, the, the most important aspects, uh, how, the, how the infantry uh, was being improved in the months leading up to the invasion, uh, how there was diff uh, additional uh, small independent... Uh, Tank units being shipped uh, sent to Normandy, where they fought on the Côte d'Antin, and we have looked at uh, at the, the three first uh, divisions, uh, Panzer divisions, which which participated in in the battle. And it's I, to come back to one thing is uh, at, at the very beginning we looked at how many uh, divisions were actually operational, and that's something people should be uh, keep, always keep in mind. If people say there's so many of this, so many of that, they could have done this and they could have done that. Just look at what's the actual state of a particular unit. Yeah. Because the fact that it exists doesn't say anything. Just look at its state. What can it do at that time? Is it ready? Uh, is it in some cases there was a division arriving in, in Belgium, the Netherlands, which was earmarked to go back to the Eastern Front. So it's, yeah, it's, it's in the West, but it's never going to be used unless there's an absolute acute emergency. Um, so try to understand what, what the numbers you're seeing, what they're saying. And what they're not saying and if you're interested reach out to someone uh find uh, look online find the right forums because forums might seem outdated at this time of twitter and facebook but forums are far more useful in general but when it comes to reaching out 
to people when you have done research and reaching new people, make sure you have a presence online and on these platforms because it's the best way to, if you, even if you're not going to write a book, to, to get your message across, to help people get better information, to point out where they who they should contact, who they can contact, and that and make people think about what they think is right because a lot of people just are convinced that what they're saying is absolutely fine. And if it's not, you need to help them uh, educate them why it's not fine and, and that it's far more complicated than that. And if people keep that in mind, I think uh, the history, the, the study of history is going uh, yeah. going a lot of places with, with all the new internet, with all the options and possibilities the internet gives us. I think even a show about how a German armor division moves. I mean, in transport, it'd be interesting. Yeah. Road wheels and trains and tracks. And, and as you say, track track wear, rubber wear, um, fuel, just exactly how you're a German high command. You're seeing a German division on a map. And you say, I want to move that division 300 miles. Just exactly what that entails and how difficult that is and all the various steps that have to be made. That would be an interesting show in its own right. But anyway... We will address that another time. So um, I will say thank you to, to Niels in a second. But in terms of what we've got coming up, tomorrow night, Prit Brutar is coming on to talk about the development of Soviet armor through World War II. And we'll kind of dispel those myths about the, the, the Russians just basically having lots of poor quality stuff in volume. No, they're doing some really uh, exciting advances with armor and uh, defense and armament. So we'll talk about that with Prit. And then on Friday, finishing off Tank Week, we've got, we've got our talk about the 79th Div Armor Division. In the Shelt Estuary um, Operation Infatuation, that will be with Philip Brazier. And I'm looking forward to that. We're talking about the role of armor with um, engineer units, which will be fascinating. And then the following week, we start off our, our histories with um, female presenters. So anyway, for tonight, thank you very much, Neil, for joining me. Uh, everyone is always asking when your book is going to be out. But as soon as your books are going to be out, you're going to come on and tell us about it. So don't panic anybody, everybody. You'll find out about it first on World War II TV. When the books are ready, it'll all be there. We'll do a special about it whenever that is. But it's sometime in the summer, isn't it, Niels? Oh, sorry, I, mu I muted you. Sorry. Sometime in the summer. Yeah. Yeah, sometime this summer. Yeah, I'm working hard with the, with the publisher right now. And I've done uh, some of the, the maps uh this week so uh if everything is okay yeah uh, it's off to the printers as quickly as possible and there will be an official announcement uh, in time super well okay then everybody i will see you all again tomorrow evening with prit brutal so thanks from uh from my behalf for watching and thanks Niels, for joining us i will see you all again on world war ii tv tomorrow night for prit and the soviet tank development so that was brilliant i enjoyed it i learned a lot i'll see you all tomorrow